So guys, this is the how-to for, for, for finding fish with satellite data. We're gonna talk about what the convergence zone is and why it matters. And believe it or not, the convergence zone is like the thing, by the way. And then we're gonna run through the, the data sets that we use to find the symptoms of the convergence zone. A convergence zone, Dave, what is a convergence zone? So let's talk about one molecule of water, one single molecule, and it gets caught in an upwelling. I'm not gonna go into why upwellings occur and why they happen and all that stuff. Just know that they do happen. You got one molecule of water that's hung up in an upwelling and it's being drug up from the bottom of the ocean and it's got nutrients in it. So it comes up to the top. Now my question to you is this one molecule of water, what happens to the molecule of water that it displaced? Well, that molecule of water gets pushed down. So we get what's called the pump effect and that's this, this circle going around, okay? This is the pump effect in an upwelling. So what happens is, is on the side that you've got the nutrients and we're pumping all these nutrients up to the top, it's being pushed back down again. So we wind up with this wall that's, that on one side is cold nutrient, uh, nutrient rich water. So the reason that it's cold is because it's, it's coming from down low. And then on the other side, it's warm, low nutrient. So over here on this side, we're having a party, woohoo! You guys been to a street party in college, right? Or a street party in your neighborhood? On this side of the road, there's girls and beer and all that great stuff. And if you walk across the street, there's nothing but crickets. That's the same deal with the convergence zone. Now the trick is, is over here where the party's going on, it doesn't mean that there's not fish everywhere along the party, all right? but where they're concentrated is right where it turns from nutrient-rich, colder water to a warm, low-nutrient water. It's right on that slide between the two, okay? Right here in this convergence zone. This is what we want to fish for. This is where we want to fish at, because that's what's holding the fish, is that convergence zone. So what we want to do is we want to use all this satellite data to find the symptoms. Over on this side, this is going to be greener. It's going to be greener water, and it's also going to have lower salinity, okay? On the warm side, it's going to be bluer. It's going to be that clear water, and it's going to be higher salinity. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense because it was pumped up from the bottom. So what happens is, is you're riding along here. Let's just say it's seven meters. You're riding along in your boat, and you've got your, your, your depth finder tuned just right so that you can see the thermocline layer. And then all of a sudden that thermocline starts dropping, man, that's the convergence zone right there, right where that thermocline layer starts to drop. So what are the symptoms of a convergence zone? A convergence zones are formed around mixing boundaries, basically where one body of water hits another one. Those things can be tide lines, temperature breaks. How's that for a current rip? This was down at the steeples one day, man, that was awesome. That was awesome right there. The fishing was just outstanding. It was really funny because it was this side too. You go on the other side, this was the offshore side, nothing. This side right here is where it was all at. Same sort of deal with the convergence zone. So we take this, the, the, the shot of this current rip. So what causes that, Dave? Why, why are they there and how do we find them? Because you and I as fishermen, we're not trying to catch one fish we're trying to catch a cooler full, right? So we want to be right at the, the best spot so that we can fill the whole cooler. So you can take the data sets from the satellite data and you can find all these symptoms, what, be it, be it a, just a mixing boundary, you know, where, where two wa uh, bodies of water are coming together, be it a temperature break, or be it a current rip. You got water running this way. You got water running that way. Right in between, this is where the rip forms. And you can see that in the current data set. We go from blue to green to yellow to red. Here, I'll make it a little easier for you. If you notice, I out, what, all I did was I went in and I outlined the currents. All right. I went in and just outlined them so that you could see where the red was and where the yellow was and where the green was and all that cool stuff. Now in this data set, I would bet, guess that's the Gulf Stream. What do y'all think? Gee, now where do I want to go fishing today? Y'all ever been around a creek or an inlet where the water's moving really fast over here and kind of slow over here? Guess what you get right where it goes from slow to fast? A current rip. Guess what you get if it's going this way and that way? A current rip. Look right here. You see where that blue is butted up against this red? There's gonna be current rips in that area. There's gonna be temperature breaks in that area. 
is going to, just about all the data sets are going to point to that same area. So let's talk about sea surface temperature. This is another symptom of the convergence zone, all right? But one thing I want to point out to you, how many of you guys have fished on the most beautiful temperature break you have ever seen in your entire life? It's gorgeous, two degree break, hard break, going from you know, 72 to 74 over 100 feet. Beautiful, you go fish the fire out of it, and there's nothing there, nada. You're like, what's going on here, what's going on? Well, it's a symptom of the convergence zone, not the convergence zone itself. So what happens is, is that temperature break forms right up on top of that, that convergence zone, and the current's running this way, and it pushes it downwind. So when you, you're working a, a sea surface temperature break, think about that. The next one that you get on, there's nothing on. You know, you found the break. You found where, the, where there's a really good piece of water, but you're catching absolutely nothing. Go up current because the current has pushed it off the convergence zone. If you go up currents where the fish are, does that make sense? They're lazy. They're lazy. Absolutely <laughs> they're lazy. <laughs> Look at this. Right across there. 68 to 74. Wouldn't that be a beautiful day to go fishing? This is a current shot. I believe this was from the 4th. February the 4th. So let's talk about chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is another data set. Um, the trick to fishing chlorophyll, though, is, is it takes time for chlorophyll to affect the fishery. When we very first get a pump in the, uh, an upwelling that's drawing those nutrients off the bottom, you get the nutrients, it goes into photosynthesis, there we go. You get the nutrients that are pumped up off the bottom and then you have photosynthesis that takes over and we get phytoplankton. Now I don't know about you guys, I'm not fishing for phytoplankton, are y'all? Y'all don't see many people standing around with a picture of the phytoplankton, right? What I'm looking for are predators. So the phytoplankton has got to be around, around long enough to attract the, the other plankton that's going to attract the small fish, that's going to attract the medium fish, until we get to the predators. This takes time, all right? Not one day, not two days. First time I see an upwelling, the first time I see an edge, I'm not going to get overly excited about it. I'm not going to get excited about that edge until it's been in place at least three days. That means I want to look at today's shot, I want to look at yesterday's shot, and I want to look at the day before shot. When you see that edge or you see that upwelling in a single spot over three days, that's when you're on the money, okay? Because it takes time for it to go through this life cycle. Really nice chlorophyll shot there. Now, I'm going to tell you all a little trick here. I think I put this in. I did. This is a modus chlorophyll shot, and I took the modus SST contours. I took the contours off of the SST shot, and I overlaid it. So you're looking at SST contours, the temperature contours, on top of the chlorophyll data. Look right here. This is the same place that just a moment ago we were talking about. Let me back up. Look right here. Look right there. Same spot. Pretty cool. You're going to find that to be true with a lot of these data sets where they're all going to point to that same area. They're all going to point where there's a temperature break and there's a chlorophyll change, there's a color change, there's current rips. They're all going to point to that same spot. So let's talk about sea surface height. You guys that follow me online, you know how much love I have for National Marine Fisheries and, and the fishery folks. You know they're most awesome, right? <laughs> Insert sarcasm here. One of the really cool things that they actually did, though, is that they tracked pelagic longlining from the 70s forward, okay? So they've got all these records. One of the things that they found in these records was that most pelagic species were caught in even to slightly positive water. So think about that just a second. Even to slightly positive. Now, why is that? Well, check this out. When you start talking about SSH, you've got areas that are high and you've got areas that are low, right? What do you think happens between them? Current. Doesn't water run downhill? Ain't we got any plumbers in this crowd? Water runs downhill, right? So if we jack up the water over here and it's low over here, this water is going to run downhill. Now here's the trick, though. It doesn't run from high to low. What it does is it goes from high and then it goes bloop down to even. And it plateaus right there around even. And then it goes bloop down to low. 
So you get high, bloop, even, bloop, low. It's that edge, that edge right in between even to slightly positive is where most of the plegic species are caught. Here's my theory. You guys ever watch, uh, what was the kid's show with the, uh, the clownfish trying to find his youngin? Nemo. Nemo, Finding Nemo. Remember in Finding Nemo when he, yeah, how'd you know that? <laughs> so in Finding Nemo, they're riding on the turtle's back, right? In the current, see, what, 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 what I think is happening is those predators are sitting there in that even water and watching the stuff go by. Swimming over there and going, wham, and swimming back out here. Because they can sit right here. If they go over there, they get washed up yonder. They just sit here and we'll wait for it to come. We'll basically, we'll wait for the dinner bell to ring. Here's a nice SSH shot. All right, this is current. February the 4th, same one for, as the SST and the chlorophyll. What do y'all notice about that? Looky there, exact same spot. Over here is high, here's low, right here's even. Amazing how that happens, isn't it? Mixed layer depth. I'll take and give you guys all the other data sets. You can have the SSTs, you can have the chlorophyll, you can have it all. You give me mixed layer depth and I'll outfish you. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? Mixed layer depth. The reason is, is that mixed layer depth is showing you the depth of the thermocline. If you take your color scope and you tune it just right, you can pick up this plankton layer. How many of y'all have been swimming in a freshwater lake? You get in the water and up here around your chest, it's all nice and warm and toasty. And you get down around your belly button and it starts getting a little cooler. And if you take your toe and you stick it way down there, you can punch through and the damn water turns cold. Everybody done that? That's thermocline, all right? Right at that thermocline layer, right where it goes from warm to cold, you wind up with this plankton layer, okay? And your color scope will pick this up. The distance from that plankton layer to the surface is called mixed layer depth. It's a pretty famous shot. This shot changed the rules of the big rock in Moorhead City. That shot did it. We're running along here. The thermocline is at seven meters. Then it drops. So we're going bloop, down to 20 meters. We're going for a little ways, and then we're coming back up to seven meters again, and then going down again. What's up with that? See, so we're high, low, high, low. Looks kind of like this. Everybody got that? That's the profile of the thermocline. So then we throw the pump into it. There's our upwelling, where it's pushing this layer of water down. Does that make sense? Now, based on what I've told you guys, about upwellings and the convergence zone. Where is it that you want to go fishing in this picture? Right there. Right there's where you want to go fishing. You don't want to be up here. You don't want to be down there. You want to be right where it changes. And if you, if you think about that picture of the convergence zone where they're going like this, this is where that wall is right here. Look, there's fish over here and there's fish over here, but they're all spread out. That's where your onesie twosie in the world. Right here's where you load the cooler. Does that make sense? There's a mixed layer depth shot. Can you see it? So we're high, low, high, low. And you go fishing right there? Imagine that. Now, isn't it kind of funny that all of these shots have wound up with the exact same spot in them? All right. If you recall, temperature, chlorophyll, currents, now mixed layer depth. Mixed layer depth is about as close as I've ever came to something that actually draws the X on the map for you. If you can find where it goes from X to Y, and you can find that, you're in the money. Mixed layer depth is the heat, in my humble opinion. Uh, yeah, that's Ronsborough Hole right there. It was pretty much anywhere in that area. You know, one of the problems with mixed layer depth is it's a fairly coarse data set. This is probably three nautical across, four nautical across each pixel. You know, unfortunately I can't get it any tighter than that, but you know, it is what it is as they say. Tricks of the trade. So right here's an SST shot. This is today's SST shot or yesterday's SST shot. So yesterday, today, yesterday, today, yesterday, today. Where's the water gonna be tomorrow? 
Guys, think about this for just a moment. Remember when you were back in school and you had the old reels of that, you know, for the movies? Y'all remember that? You young guys don't. Y'all like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Us old guys, we remember that, man. You walk in there and you see the big projector sitting there with the big reel. You're like, yes. That's the movie, day, right? movie day. That's exactly right. So you take that, and, and if you pulled one of those and you looked up through it, you know, with the light behind it, you can see each individual frame, right? What you're seeing in satellite data shots is an individual frame on a movie that started a couple of million years ago. It's one frame. And it's moving that fast, okay? So what we've got to do is we've got to go back and look at day before yesterday, yesterday, today, in order to figure out where it's going to be tomorrow. Because we don't give a crap where it's at today. What we want to know is where is it going to be tomorrow. Is that not right? If you went right there to that edge today, guess what? It ain't going to be there. What you've got to do is you've got to figure out where it's going to be tomorrow. And the way that we do that is by backing up and going forward. By backing up and going forward. Now I ask you again, if this is yesterday and that's today, where is it going to be tomorrow? This whole thing's pushing up to the north, isn't it? All right, so, so right here it is today, uh, yesterday. Right there it is tomorrow. You see what I'm getting at? Tomorrow it's going to be about right there. Does that make sense? All right, so one of the other tricks of the trade are the color ramps. So as you get into the, especially, specifically the SST data shots, you got to be able to use the color ramps and use them effectively. Because these color ramps, let me give you an example of bluefin tuna. Big bluefin bite here recently up off Moorhead, right? That water was 52, 53 degrees. To get a really good color separation in there, you're not going to use the same color ramp in that area as we would in the Gulf Stream in the heat of the summer when it's 85 and 90 degrees. All right, so you, you, you got to be able to change the color ramps over the course of the year. So each one of the shots that I'm about to show you are from the exact same SST shot, but it's got a different color ramp on it. Regardless of what your monitor manufacturers tell you, Regardless of you know, all the, the hype in the world, there are only 256 colors that are available. They're called hex codes. If I took one individual hex code and assigned it to one-tenth of a degree of temperature, I could cover 25.6 degrees. Everybody follow that math? 256, 25.6, okay? I cheated. I stretched it to 30. So I'm covering one point whatever. My point is that you got to pick the, the color ramp for the species, the time of year, to what it is that you're looking for. So I want you all to watch this. This is the exact same SST shot with the color ramp. So there I'm ramped between 30 and 60. Watch what happens. There's 40 and 70. 30, 60, 40, 70. 50, 80. 60, 90. 65, 85. You see what's happening though? It's all kind of moving offshore. The detail's moving offshore. If you look in here, look how beautiful you can see these temperature breaks in here. All right, now we've got temperature breaks out here too, but you can't see them very well. They're all red. But if you move up one shot, now I've got all this beautiful, beautiful uh, contrast in here, but you can't see squat back here. Does that make sense? So make sure that you use the, use the color ramps. Change the color ramp around until you get detail in the area that you're looking for. If you're hunting king mackerel in the spring, move the color ramp around until you got you know, the, the right area with detail in it. Don't be stuck just because that's the default color ramp. And this is just all the different color ramps that we offer, which is a whole bunch. There's even one in here, uh, like 75, 95, yeah. This is for the heat of the summer. Look at that. You can't see anything. You know, it's all blank back in here. Let me show you one other little trick, too. Let's say that you were king mackerel fishing and you were looking for 70-degree water. Right there's your 70-degree water edge. Gee, that's kind of cool. Let's say that you're looking for 65-degree water. Right, there, right, right there's your water edge. Hmm. 
Hadn't thought about that, huh? Run perpendicular, not parallel. No matter what data set you're looking at, no matter what feature it is that you're trying to find, always, always, always run perpendicular to it. If you run parallel, you're liable to never find it. It's down off of Georgetown Hole. This is last night, by the way. I want you to look at the edge of that beautiful eddy. Ah. Fellow's going to run in. Let's say he gets right here to Georgetown Hole, and he starts trolling down the 300, the 300 foot line. Look, that's him right there, number one. Is he ever going to hit, find that edge? Ever? Trolling 10 hours? You know, he might hit it late in the day, but it's going to be a while. He's probably going to call me up, cuss me out, and go, hey, you couldn't find nothing. I told you to go to Georgetown Hole and turn due south until you hit it. See, that's what we did right here in number two. And you run perpendicular to it, by golly, you will hit it. The trick is to always be perpendicular. I had another slide that, that, that in the old map where, you know, it was a really, really close one. I mean, where you miss it by a mile. This, this was the best example of what I could find. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 this is last night's shot from, uh, uh, from Georgetown Hole. That's Georgetown Hole right there. I bet you it was, it was probably pretty smoking. If he found that edge, it is. All right, so, so, so that's it for Tricks of the Trade. Do we have any questions? Fish finding from space. Yes, sir. How does the cloud cover impact all of these? Um, so any of the direct observation, the, the question was, uh, how does cloud cover affect the, the satellite coverage? Um, any of the direct observation things will be affected by cloud cover. Most of them, most <coughs> satellite data sets are affected by cloud cover. AVHRR has the best shot, but the worst cloud filter. MODIS has the best cloud filter, but not quite as good a shot as AVHRR, if that makes any sense. And VIRS is about kind of right there, you know, in, in that same thing. If y'all recall, we had a wind event this past Tuesday. Before that, we'd had like six days of nothing but just solid clouds. What's really cool is also included in this is the mapping data CCAST. And CCAST is modeled data. It's not direct observation. It's modeled. So you can go in there and you can get an SST shot or, or a, a temperature shot, uh, whether there's been clouds or not. Is it as good as direct observation? No, sir. And I, I doubt you ever will be. But in the same breath, it, it at least points you in the right direction anyway. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You will find weed lines where you find the temperature breaks and you find one body of water passing underneath the other one. Now, I have seen, I have seen some, some statements that you can see them in true color and things like that in the true color shots. I, I call horse hockey. Uh, that's right. That's right. Because what you find is, is the cooler water is going to be uh, subjugated underneath the warmer water, and it's going to wind up kind of like this. And it's that edge right there between those two data sets that are actually is where the weed line forms. And that's generally what causes them. So a lot of times, if, if you look at both the currents and the, and the temperature, when you see those good hard breaks is generally where you'll find those weed lines. Any other questions? All right, cool. Yes, sir. The SSH and the uh, uh, mixed layer stuff, is that coming from the HICOM model? Is that what the SSH is direct observation. Yeah, that, that is direct observation. The mixed layer depth is, is from uh, uh, the HICOM model. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm.